What I love about the city and the stories of the city and the innovations behind it are some of them are like these crazy, wacky things that you don't even think about. So New York decides to push for hybrid taxi cabs, 12,000 cabs that will be hybrid or super efficient. It makes a difference. DC says when you landscape your property, you got to landscape it so the water doesn't run off because we got a runoff problem. When I changed my driveway, my driveway is bricks or cobblestones. So when the water falls, it falls and then drains through the cobblestones so the oil from my car when I park it there doesn't go into the road, into the sewage system, and then out into the Potomac. River. When you think about buildings, cities change building codes, and that becomes very interesting because when you improve your building and it's a pain and costs more money, you have to make it more energy efficient. This is how we create our sustainable cities, and we can do it in a big way because cities are lots of people. It costs, but it's an investment over time. That's a story that we tell. So, our cities are the lifeblood, the heartbeat of the planet. As we said, it's where people go and they live and increasingly they're going to be doing that. But if the cities and the heartbeat and the heart doesn't work, the lungs won't work. And I want to, for a few minutes with you, take you from the heart to the lungs, the forests, this amazing resource that we've got because the fate of the forest actually is directly connected to the fate and the trajectory of the city. So we're going to hear from a tropical biologist. He has earned the title the godfather of biodiversity. He has been visiting the Brazilian rainforest for five decades. His story is extraordinary and I'd like you to see how it's been captured and told. The first time I walked into the forest, my first reaction was, it's really green here. <laughs> I've never seen so many shades of green in my life. I'm Tom Lovejoy. I'm an environmental scientist, a biologist, field biologist, but also a conservationist. I first went to the Amazon in June of 1965, so that's 50 years. I got the opportunity to go to the world's largest wilderness, and I never looked back. The Amazon is the single largest repository of biological diversity on land. Sort of like having the biologist equivalent of a Christmas stocking that you never got to the bottom of because there are always new and wonderful things. There has been incredible change since I first set foot in the Amazon. When I first got there, there was one highway from capital, Brasilia, to Belang, the port city where I was living. It was like three million people in the entire Amazon. It's way over 30 million today. There's been a lot of deforestation. Right now the Amazon is at a 20% deforestation level. And I think that's the tipping point. As we eat away at the Amazon, it eats away at that incredible diversity. It's also just like book burning, uh, because every species is a unique set of solutions to a unique set of biological problems, any one of which can suddenly be of great importance. I think the next 50 years will be the test, whether all the good things that have been done all the good trends consolidate into something which actually maintains the Amazon as a whole. The change has to be made now. My work will never be done. <laughs> uh, but obviously, I'm only going to be able to contribute you know, as long as I'm breathing. My hope is that some of the things I've started will lead to a, a new generation thinking about the Amazon uh, as something to be treasured, uh, to be husbanded, 
and to be taken care of and to provide that joy of scientific exploration and associated human benefit forever. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Tom Lovejoy. When Thank you. When, when, when Tom is done with his comments, he will be joined by Shelby Thomas, who is a student at the University of Florida, who has spent considerable time in Brazil. She'll speak with him and have some Q&A with him and then open it up to you. So prepare your questions and prepare to enjoy Tom's talk. Tom, it's all yours. Thank you. So when I was getting ready for the, the ninth grade, I learned I was either going to have to take biology that year or the year later. And with enormous prescience, I announced that I would take it the first year and get it over with. Uh, and instead, uh, by the end of that year, I understood the outline of life on Earth, which today we call biological diversity. And I just never been able to get enough of it. I've just been entranced with it. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's something that is in all of us. Uh, we're quite capable of that if we have the opportunity to see it. Uh, so each one of these things that is flipping by on the screen behind me uh, is fascinating, it's beautiful, it's wonderful, and each one actually has a four billion year lineage, just like each one of us. And when you start thinking of life on Earth that way, all of a sudden you have much more respect for it uh, than we occasionally get ourselves into just by focusing on ourselves and on our technological wonders. So one, the question here is, is, how does all of this actually relate to cities, which is the theme of Planet Forward this year? Um, and I'll give you two different ways it relates to cities. Uh, one involves this notion of the variety of life as being the fundamental library for the life sciences, uh, mostly unread so far. And it can produce just very surprising uh, results. So there's a really nasty snake in those forests. I see it occasionally. It's called the Bushmaster. Uh, People usually don't have cozy feelings about it. And when you tell them that its venom causes its victim's blood pressure to go to zero, any warmth they might have felt about that snake vanishes. But that, in fact, led through a series of scientific investigations to revealing an unknown system of regulation of blood pressure in mammals and humans, and then to medicines that work on that. They're called the ACE inhibitors. And literally hundreds of millions of people today live longer, healthier, and more productive lives because of that bit of obscure uh, biology. And there's also an enormous water lily that grows in the Amazon. Uh, it has pads like this big around. Uh, and there's a really great story, which I don't have time to tell in detail, but basically it inspired somebody to think that the way the lily pad was constructed underneath uh, would probably support a lot of weight. And he did an experiment which showed that in fact it did, and then he thought it would be fun to design a glass house based on those principles. And that in turn became his design for the Crystal Palace of the London Exhibition of 1851, uh, which is the origin of modern metal beam architecture. So the vast majority of buildings in the cities of this planet actually derive from the underside of the giant water lily. Uh, but there's another hugely important way that the Amazon and the other tropical forests uh, relate to well-being in cities and that is its direct link to climate change. So all the fossil fuels we've been burning are basically old ecosystems, trapped sunlight 
uh, now being released in an instant. And the modern ecosystems are also all built of carbon. And so the amount of deforestation that occurs today actually is, produces about 30%, this is the gross figure, 30% of annual emissions of CO2. That's greater than the transportation sector. So suddenly that makes the point that if we treat the biology of the planet properly, uh, we can actually not only reduce emissions, but by restoring degraded ecosystems, uh, encouraging forests to return, uh, restoring coastal wetlands, we could actually take maybe even as much as half a degree of climate change back out of the atmosphere uh, before it's actually happened. There's a lag time between getting a CO2 level and it trapping uh, the relevant amount of radiant heat. So basically, uh, the climate that cities will be coping with uh, in part has to be uh, ameliorated by how we actually manage uh, the climate system and recognizing that it is a combined biological and physical system. It is not just a physical system. It is in fact a living planet uh, and if we manage it that way, uh, it will make uh, for a much better future for ourselves uh, and other forms of life. Uh, but cities are also part of the solution uh, in the rainforest regions of the world. So today there are about 35 million people living in the Amazon region. Uh, and their potential for destruction of the rainforest is quite large, except for the, the good news that an increasing number of them are actually concentrated in cities. So what I like to say is the quality of life in Amazon cities, in fact, is very much related to the future of the rainforest itself. Uh, and so the, the city of Manaus, uh, which has a favorable uh, economic incentive situation, actually makes most of the computer boards uh, for all the computers and handheld devices in Brazil. Uh, the largest Harley-Davidson factory in the world is in Manaus. And it attracts people, there's economic opportunity there, uh, instead of being out in the forest doing slash and burn, uh, which works uh, if there are not too many people and you don't repeat it too often. Uh, but it's nothing like the opportunity that they can get uh, in the cities. So in the end, I think what we're talking about here is actually looking at the planet uh, as uh, an integrated whole. Uh, humanity living in cities, those cities being sustainable, uh, and allowing the biology of the planet, the diversity of life on Earth, uh, to flourish and produce these countless benefits uh, that basically still remain to be discovered. So for those of you who are interested in that kind of exploration and discovery, uh, that is a vast frontier uh, which can bring all kinds of benefits to people. Uh, so what we're talking about uh, is managing ourselves, uh, because if we're going to manage the planet, that actually means managing ourselves, uh, getting rid of the hubris uh, to think that we can just do what we want to do, uh, but explore all the opportunity uh, that's inherent in living on a living planet. So. Cities are important uh, in all of this. Uh, cities are important for the future of the Amazon. The future of the rainforest is important for the climate of cities, economic activity in cities. And in the end, I envision a future in which 
human ingenuity and human aspiration is actually embedded in nature. I think we need to look at our future that way and what a glorious future it can be. Thank you very much. Where is Shelby? Shelby, come on. <laughs> it's all yours. See, I didn't run over. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Shelby Thomas. I'm a student at the University of Florida, majoring in marine science and microbiology. Um, so Tom, I guess we can begin, begin our questions. I was fortunate to travel to Sao Paulo, Brazil, one of the biggest cities in the world. And I went with, on a study abroad with the University of Florida in Challenge 2050 to go speak with industry professionals and different organizations uh -huh. about the global issues that they're facing right now with such a big population. So they have one of the biggest populations and they're facing energy crises, food and water availability, sustainability, and much more, and problems that we'll be facing globally by challenge 2050. Sorry. Um, so one of my questions to you is how can we get people to realize their impact daily and how can we make people not only care about their impact locally but globally? So one of the really interesting things about Sao Paulo is uh, a little bit after you were there, they had this unprecedented drought. And there was a real worry about sufficient water supply for the city. And that was partly connected to the way the Amazon makes half of its own rainfall. And it's so-called rivers in the sky. And the rivers in the sky weren't coming down to southern Brazil, uh, and it, that was a serious wake-up call about the importance of forests, and also about the need to do some actual restoration of forests in Sao Paulo State. Uh, but I think in the end, the key here is giving everybody that chance to have a little brush with life on Earth. Uh, a you know, there are parks in Sao Paulo, you know, you can go see an animal or, you know, free animal, you know, flying free or whatever. Uh, and I think it's inherent in the way we're actually, we've evolved. That if you give a child a chance, uh, they will respond to that. And then, of course, use the media. Right? So that's why I started the Nature Series on public television 33 years ago. Uh -huh. um, I guess we can open the floor to any questions that you want to have. Go ahead. Is, can somebody bring him a mic? Hello. Hello. Hey, how's it going? Um, I was wondering if you could uh, recall maybe a story of, of maybe you in the jungle or somewhere that was really impactful to you and, and like gave you like a click and you're like, this is something special. I wonder if you could share that with us. So uh, the one that most immediately comes to mind, uh, it's not about a huge tarantula or, you know, a bushmaster. Uh, it's about uh, being down in a dammed up stream at the end of the day, it's sort of half light and washing up, a whole bunch of us washing up, including David Quammen, the well-known nature science writer. And all of a sudden, there was this big, bright, red, orange light going like that. And nobody said anything, because it was sort of like a micro UFO, and nobody quite believed they were actually seeing what they were seeing. And then all of a sudden it stopped in midair because it had gotten caught in a net set up to catch bats later that night. And it turned out to be an enormous beetle with a light organ like you've never seen. Uh, so we brought it up to, to camp and it, you know, it, it kept sort of mooning us as it were <laughs> with its light organ and then it got either tired or bored. Uh, 
and so we let it go. And I've only seen that once again, and it was almost exactly a year later in the same place. And that's the excitement of being in a tropical rainforest, because most of the species, in fact, have very low numbers. So the, the chances of seeing repeats is much lower than it is in a forest or a grassland up here. So. Anyone else that right here? Can we get the mic here? Sorry. Have you faced any pushback from the government of Brazil um, when investigating deforestation um, or Brazilian private companies? So well, that's a really good question. Uh, I haven't you had. You oh, it? the question was whether I got any pushback. Uh, around the deforestation issue from the Brazilian government uh, or from particular companies? And the answer is mostly no. I managed to negotiate that. Uh, I'm sort of seen as almost Brazilian. And I do have two Brazilian children who were born in Brazil, right? Uh, so they're dual nationalities. Uh, there was, there was one time when one of our scientists uh, wrote a uh, paper in science projecting where deforestation might go. And the Brazilian government actually wanted science not to publish it, right? which of course did not happen. Uh, but that was a pretty tense moment. Uh, and there was another time when I got accused of being a bio-pirate because that's sort of a paranoia they have in Brazil that somebody's going to take some of their valuable biology and take it off somewhere else and make lots of money out of it, which is their perception, in fact, of what happened with rubber, although the rubber tree seeds did leave legally. Uh, but it led to the collapse of the entire Amazon rubber trade, which was extremely lucrative. I think we, that's all the time we have for questions, but thank you, Tom. Great. Thank you. Tom, um, before you go, um, in, in, in connecting the city and the forest, Manaus is sort of the gateway city to the, yeah. to the Amazon. Do, what kind of innovations, all right, let's keeping with that, what kind of special things do they do, or do they, that the rest of us can learn from to preserve that delicate balance? Are there special technologies that you see at work, special ways that they're, because there are all sorts of pressures in Manaus too, to continue a economic development and provide jobs and grow, right? Which is at odds with the, with the rainforest, and yet, and yet, if you can concentrate people in the city, maybe yeah. you present, prevent or at least slow the sprawl of, of deforestation. So, so it's imperfect. Uh, it is an ongoing issue. Uh, but most of the manufacturing that occurs there is small-scale manufacturing, uh, not big sort of steel factories or stuff like that. Uh, so it produces a lot of employment uh, and keeps people in the city. Uh, so that's important. It's that's important. But what I'm, my, my, one of my current little projects at the moment is to take the map of the Amazon that was in the November issue of the National Geographic, first complete one in decades, mm -hmm. and get one with a study plan in every school in every Amazon country. Teach yeah, and reach. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so if we could get our act together at some point, might some of us come visit your Camp 41 in the Amazon? Yeah, absolutely. We'll have hammocks for you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take you up on it. <laughs> That's great. Thanks, Tom, Good. so much for the time. I'm working on that, by the way. Tom and I have actually had this conversation. If we could get things in the right place, maybe one of our Story Fest prizes one day would be to join Tom at his Camp 41 in the Amazon. How cool would that be? Would that be awesome? So we could do that.